All right. On this edition of Current Affairs Taiwan, we have quite a show coming up for, here for you. So what are we, what are we uh, talking about this week, Mike? Han Goyi and the rally with Ho Yo <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And we're going to talk a little bit about campaign manager Eric Chu and some of the travails of the KMT. Mm-hmm. And a little bit on the economy Woo-hoo. and one or two of the interesting local races. Yep. And then something about the economy. And finally, we're going to end with a little change of Taiwan news and the way they treat Xi Jinping. That's right. Yes. With a little segue in there about, I think, Thais, Han saying that Thais look down on us. Oh, that's right. We're doing that, too. And don't yeah. forget, mm-hmm. report.tw. Report.tw. Coming up. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Current Affairs Taiwan. I'm Michael Turton, and this is Donovan Smith. And Dunn Smith is here with a plug. I'm here with a plug. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Just wanted to let you know that uh, report.tw, the website that I mentioned last week, um, is really kind of up and running now. Uh, so if you go and you check out the website, you'll see uh, the articles that we've been following uh, throughout the week. And it's kind of a if you if you go through the website, what you'll see is it's a series of if you're interested in Taiwan politics or foreign affairs, um, You'll see that there's uh, quotes that you know that uh, I thought were were particularly important from different articles, and then you can click on the links to go see the original source articles. There's also original commentary. Um, obviously, we'll po- we post this up, uh, but I've been posting up some uh, Con- Donovan's quick takes. They're they're, they're kind of unpolished, uh, short articles, uh, sort of uh, commenting on what's going on, um, and uh, hopefully you'll be putting up some stuff soon too should be well. yeah yeah should be um and then uh there'll be some more content coming out which is uh we'll tell you a little bit more about hopefully next week hopefully that'll be up and running as well um hopefully uh so there should there's a lot going on here so if you're interested in taiwan politics or foreign affairs check out report.tw this is where i'm supposed to say that's report.tw that's right okay so uh, this week was a little slower than some weeks, so <laughs> this might well be a short show. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so Han Goy was in the news. Han Goy, the Kuomintang KMT presidential candidate, mm-hmm. was in the news this week. Uh, he was in Wall Street Journal denying that he was the pro-China candidate, blaming the DPP for a bad media coverage, and um, and saying all his campaign stuff about how Taiwan is declining and all that good stuff. So. <laughs> he was also he was also saying the same thing about the ties, wasn't he? They look down on Taiwan now. Southeast Asians are looking down on Taiwan. This, this week he was talking about it. Yeah, I actually wrote up a, on report.tw. That's uh, report.tw. <laughs> yes. I, I wrote up a, a little short article on that. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so he was saying that um, ties uh, look down on, he says, they look down on us. And the, the, the reason for this he is that um, the Thai government recently announced that they were going to demand that, Thai, that Taiwanese who want to visit Thailand, they have to show a financial statement from the last three months. Basically, they got enough money to make the trip and go home. Well, it turns out that they've they're implementing the same thing for people from France and Germany and you know some other countries. So they're not specifically picking on Taiwanese. It's a bunch of countries, um, and so he came out and said the ties are looking down on us. It's because Taiwan's declining and our economy terrible and all that good stuff, as you put it. Right. <laughs> and so now, what I think is interesting about this is this is the same guy who calls Filipinas Marias, which is a, a, a not a very nice term uh, <clears throat> for Filipina uh, women mostly who often are caregivers or um, here in Taiwan. And he's used it multiple times. So it's considered a racist term. And, you know, so now I, so what I, I, I you know, and so he, he uses this terminology that ties are looking down. I think there's a bit of a history behind this. Yeah. Sure. Um, and um, why, don't, why don't you take it away? I mean, you, you know this as well as I do. Well, but you, well, as you noted on the report, this situation used to be the reverse, right? Mm-hmm. Philippines used to be richer than Taiwan. Mm-hmm. Taiwanese used to go down to Philippines to find work. Right. Yeah. So this this thing where it actually... Bespeak, it actually speaks to the insecurity of 
these people who now look down on Southeast Asians. Right. And now, oh my God, they might be looking down on us. Oh, the oh loss no. Of face. Yeah. So, but that's, uh, hopefully that will change as more Taiwanese go out into Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. uh, not just to the countries that have been popular, like Thailand, but apparently there's a large business uh, in community in Indonesia mm -hmm. and now Burma and uh, several other places. So, Hopefully, all this will change. And of course, as we both have been noting in our respective writings, this is the best. This young generation, this generation mm -hmm. of young Taiwanese, is probably the best generation of young people that Taiwan has ever produced. Yes, they're traveled, they're cosmopolitan, they have some dim idea of the world out there. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm looking forward to the the future of Taiwan. Yeah, and I think this is a big generational difference between Han's followers, who per they remember Taiwan being poor, right? Um, when they were very little. Right. And their generation, the one before them, produced a, a wave of newly rich, not very classy business types who would go out, generally these men who go out and flaunted their wealth as ostentatiously as possible. And for a while, through the 80s and 90s, uh, and into the early 2000s even, in Southeast Asia and in China, Taiwanese had this awful reputation right, for just being terrible employers, flashy, arrogant. Um, <clears throat> and so it's a really terrible reputation. Now, young Taiwanese, and so the older generations and a lot of these hand supporters, they have the insecurities of that era. Right. And, you know, they felt the need to be so ostentatious. Young Taiwanese aren't even aware of this, or if they do, I mean, they don't remember it, and they a lot of them probably aren't even aware of this. Right. They grew up in a world where Taiwanese are fairly well respected and liked throughout East Asia, and um, at the very least, they're not disliked. Um, and this is a country that punches well above its weight on the international stage, considering the size uh, of Taiwan. Um, so it's it, it, so this is a generation that, that's grown up to be rightfully and justifiably proud of being Taiwanese, and so they don't have the same insecurities. Um, so this is one of these big generational gaps between the followers of Han Guoyu and the uh, younger generations who basically almost nobody in the younger generation support, so supports Han Guoyu. Every day in my classes, at, at both at the university and at the high school where I'm teaching now, the students make remarks disdaining Han Guoyu. Mm -hmm. Or if something pops up that someone is acting funny, they'll say Han Guoyu's name right. you know, in history. Who is, who is this person? And I always hear Han Guoyu. <laughs> yeah. who's the guy who did blah 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 oh it's definitely Hank <laughs> he's just a figure being mocked among among the under 40 crowd so okay okay All so right. that was Han he was in WSJ, uh, WSJ and uh, the, there was a big rally mm -hmm. and who showed up at that rally but Hoyoi new Taipei mayor Hoyoi yeah, we've discussed him several times. Yeah. He's not been very supportive of Han. In fact, he, <laughs> no. he dissed him a couple of times, saying okay. he didn't want to participate in the campaign because he's got a city to run. Yeah, I'm the newly elected mayor, and I have a city to run, <laughs> uh, which, of course, is a, is a diss at the KMT presidential candidate, Han Guoyu, who is a newly elected mayor of Kaohsiung, and then basically hasn't been doing his job because, well, he's been campaigning, he's been for, campaigning president. for president. Yeah. So Ho was on stage with him. Yes. And now he's been up to now. He's been uh, Hoyo. He's been uh, avoiding. Uh, he refused to be his campaign manager for New Taipei City, which normally you do, um, even if it's just ceremonial as a show of support. Um, he only once that I know of uh, appeared on stage with him this time, even though they campaigned quite a bit together with uh, Lu Xiuyan from Taichung. Right. Uh, in the local elections last year. He uh, up until this weekend, he only showed up once at a hand rally in New Taipei City, and he showed up on stage at a totally different time. As so he Anguid. wasn't there with him. So he wasn't <laughs> photographed with him. Uh, but finally, he relented and he showed up on stage in New Taipei City, standing next to Han Guoyu, and then of course there's Ma Ying-jeou and Wu Duanyi and all these big shots from the KMT. And then they all raise their hands, and there's Hoyoi and Han Guoyu holding hands in the line of all the big shots raising their arms. Um, so I had some speculations on um, why did Han relent? 
Why did Ho? You, it Sorry, why Ho relent? Yes. Because you said he was hope. Well, there's a few yeah. things. In the future, he's going to be president. Maybe he's going to run. He's. Gonna, I think he's going to run for. Well, I started off by saying that. Obviously, the party's been pressuring him, and that may be a factor, but I don't think it's the only one. Right. Because he's bucked the party on a few things, like, you know, doing, you know, the flag raising ceremony on Double Ten Day yeah, all and that stuff. stuff like that. Right. Um, but I, I think that, you know, so that may be a factor, but I don't think that pressure from, from Wudu and he did it. Um, that's the party chair. What I do think is that. He's got his eye on running either as the KMT party chair or as president in the future. And he's going to need two things. One is within the party, if he's going to continue to run under the KMT banner, he can't right now go out and be totally disloyal to the party's presidential candidate and then later demand loyalty from hand supporters yeah. uh, in a future run. They're a big chunk of the party. Right. Um, so he, if he wants to get their support in the future, at least not their outright opposition, he's got to be a little nicer to them. The other thing is, uh, Han supporters of the Han army, um, his supporters are fervent. They're rabid. They will often, they go after enemies of either real or perceived <laughs> of, of Han Guoyu. They attack them mercilessly online. They physically attacked people. Um, and they are fervent. They're they're extremely intense. Yeah. Um, and if uh, he wants to run uh, for president, he's going to need their votes. Yeah. Well, you and I were speculating after the show last week that mm -hmm. that he has to make some kind of move, right? If yeah. he wants to, if he wants to go for the chairmanship, or else maybe even leave the party and move to another party. Mm -hmm. Because he's been, he's clearly been uh, dissatisfied with the KMT. Yeah. But this looks like he's set on staying in the KMT and maybe moving up the ladder within the party somehow. That's a possibility. Yeah. I mean, obviously the KMT is still a major party, um, but and this was the big news this week. They can't pay their bills. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All that money they got from Terry Go. Yep. There's no more out there because they told him to. Uh, they yes when they didn't make him the candidate they basically said all the money you've given up to us doesn't mean a thing yep so i i wrote a a, a little piece also on report.tw that's uh, that's report.tw yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> Any, every time you say that i'm just going to echo it report.tw yes. <laughs> that's dot tw just in case you didn't get that don't make me echo you again <laughs> <laughs> so um anyway so i wrote up another piece again it's another donovan's quick take up up there um and again these are quick and dirty short articles uh with thoughts off the top of my head but the um is yeah i point out is that wudoni and i'll probably write a serious formal article for someone maybe maybe km i don't know but um uh you know in the next week or so on this is how really truly awful a KMT chair Udoni has been. I can't wait to read it. He's been a disaster. On so many levels. Yeah. Now, when the... Just a little bit of history for viewers who might not know this. Essentially, the KMT, when they came over from China after 1949, A, they brought a lot of money from China. The Treasury and, uh, you know, and they brought that in. But they also... When they came in, because it was a one-party state, they didn't really distinguish very clearly between the party and the state. And what they did is they took over uh, a lot of the Japanese colonial uh, properties and infrastructure and, uh, and nationalized others and just outright stole some stuff from some people because, well, why not? You're a one-party straight. You can get away with it. So it was martial law, and they could get away with it. So the party, sometimes the government would take it officially for the state. Right. Sometimes the party, it was just given to the party. Uh, sometimes it wasn't even clear, really, which one was what. Um, and so the when Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP finally won both the legislature and the presidency, they put in this ill-gotten assets law which is popular um, generally, obviously not with a KMT, but 
it's to recover prop because it one for a long time the media called the KMT the richest political party in the world. That was their moniker. Um, now, I, whether it was accurate or not, I don't know, but that was a, a f- frequently repeated right. line. Uh, and they were colossally rich, and there was no question about that. So they've had a lot of their assets frozen by the ill-gotten assets committee. Um, now they still have income coming in, um, but they should have a lot more. Now, part of their problem is institutional. Um, they have, uh, you know, because it's been they've been rich, they they never really need to worry about money much. So they hired all these people, for, you know, plum patronage positions, and. <laughs> As Nathan Batto put it, the professional cigarette smokers and tea drinkers. Yeah, Nathan Batto's <laughs> great comment. That was a great comment. Um, and uh, and they still haven't gotten rid of all these people. And even the ones that they have. Now, this is something he pointed out, which I didn't know. Yeah, and- is that they got rid of a lot of like professional pollsters and people like this who are really useful. But not the cigarette smokers and tea drinkers. <laughs> and then, of course, once they get rid of all these people, then they have pensions and they have severance pay. Yeah. So, you know, even if they do move to cut costs quite a bit, they still are on the hook for the pensions and the severance. It's not going to appear right away, the right. savings, yeah. Yeah, so it's going to take a while. Um, but now the thing is, is that uh, Wu's predecessor, Hong Xiuzhu, what she did, because the law had come in and they were, like, really short on cash in hand, she went out and she borrowed money in her own name and... She found initially it was a mystery donor, but it turns out a massive amount of money was loaned to the party by Terry Goh's mother. That was the conduit for Terry Goh's money to go in, and he basically saved the KMT. Wow. So then what does Wu Duanyi do? <laughs> Wu Duanyi pays him back by arranging things so that he's not going to be the winner of the primary. Yes. Rigged the whole thing in favor of Hang Guoyu. Yeah. Openly, I mean, he he wasn't being secretive. This is, I'm not. This is not a conspiracy theory. It was. It, it came out and basically said, "We want to change the rules to make it so that we can get Hangul Yu as our candidate." They, you yeah. know, he flat out was saying it uh, to accommodate his you know needs and all that. So, um, so that's and then you know you look at so what has Wu Duni been doing to fix the finances of the party? Let me guess, nothing. That's what it appears. Yeah. As far as I can tell, he's done nothing. <clears throat> now, keep in mind that this is a party that traditionally has r- as good relations with uh, big business groups and a lot of ties, official and uh, traditionally official, but now unofficial ties with a lot of big uh, businesses. And keep in mind that this is a party whose traditional top leadership, the big the you know the old traditional big leaders of it like <clears throat> looking at you Lian Jen um are are extremely rich but the KMT has just announced they haven't been able to pay the December salaries so none of those uh, old people with tons of cash are uh, going to kick any back to the KMT huh you know I have the sneaking suspicion Wu Duanyi just hasn't even gotten around to, to asking. asking them. That wouldn't surprise me. He just doesn't seem organized. Like he's made no provisions because the thing is the KMT gets a large amount of money in government subsidies. Yes. Um and they do get money from fundraising, at least they did in the last election. Um so they should be able to and with all these wealthy people that they know and in the party Where's the fundraising been? So and you now, know what? Udoni hasn't publicly complained, and, and he's a public complainer when things uh, yeah. upset him. And there's been no public comment from saying, all these rich people yeah. in the KMT, they're not donating. He said nothing about it. Right. So it looks to me like Wu is, uh, is not going out there and drumming up cash. At least you got to give Hong credit for finding money when mm-hmm. they needed money. Yeah. I mean, she so, yeah, she she bought. I mean, she didn't have time really with the the, the law that passed, and she, so she thought on her feet. She came up with a solution, and she did it. Yeah, she pulled it off. Yeah. Um, you know, she had her eye on the ball and what was important. And what happened to her? Oh yeah, they pulled her off the presidential uh, campaign and substituted yeah. Eric Ju in. <laughs> so, uh, but the, she was the party chair after that anyway. Historically, yeah. there. So. 
and the other thing is is that I don't know if you noticed, but uh, Hangwo, you just uh, has just started promoting uh, campaign merch on his Facebook page. Uh, you know, you know, selling hats and stuff with that Taiwan Up logo. And, you know, <laughs> so now he's pitching <laughs> they campaign didn't... merch because I think his campaign needs the money. Yeah, they probably do. Yeah, didn't. Oh gosh! No. Oh, and then yeah. there's all the allegations that he was given money or money was funneled in via China, which we talked about last week. And he said, not one NT uh, has come from China into his campaign. Did we talk about that last week? We did talk about we that did. last okay, week. Good. good. Yeah, we met up on Wednesday and <laughs> sometimes our personal conversations and what we talk about on the show get a little muddled in my head. <laughs> so speaking of uh, campaign managers, yes, Han has named Eric Ju, who mm -hmm. was the candidate who replaced uh, Hong Shouju in the last presidential election. Yep. And he was the party like, chair at the time. Yes, but, that's mm -hmm. right. So it looks like there might actually be some sanity behind that campaign. Yeah, I mean, he he's, he was a fairly well re regarded uh, mayor of, of New Taipei. He, as far as I know, he did not an inspiring job as a chairman of the KMT, but a capable. Yeah. Job. Um, <clears throat> so well, he seems to be a capable administrator, and you know. But when you're looking at all this the, mm -hmm. for the last, say, you know, since 2000, people at the under the top leadership have been demanding that they have a youth movement 2000 election mm -hmm. 2004 2005 chairmanship election remember when uh when Ma Ying-jeou was running against Wang Jingping and the, there was yep. the SK2 movement oh right yes right <laughs> to bring in SK2s of whitening cream and it's supposed to make you look younger and these and then young people in the KMT were wanted to SK2 the KMT right yeah uh -huh. they wanted to make it look younger right so this is this long term thing going on and mm -hmm. still there's no sign anywhere in this party that they're actively promoting and recruiting uh, and trying to get young people, younger people up into positions of authority. Mm -hmm. They keep reshuffling the same names. And you saw this on the party list, especially. That was like a strong signal that the KMT mm -hmm. intergenerational change has not yet hit the KMT the way that it has, that it has hit the DPP. Yeah. With, where Tsai Ing-wen is actually the president, but not from the generation that carried out the revolution. Yeah. So she's the first. She was actually the sign that, however, however turbulent and difficult it was, the DPP has passed through that period. Yeah, yeah, and the KMT still hasn't. So, and there seems to be two two things going on here. <clears throat> One <clears throat> is that traditionally, when they did do, they they actually used to be better, at least, at generational change, because they brought up their kids. <laughs> <laughs> they brought their kids up but, through the uh, ranks. All their kids are Taiwanese now. <clears throat> or they went to the U.S. Oh, yeah. They, 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 they've all got, you know, like uh, Hang Wuyu's, you know, daughter has got an apartment in Vancouver. Or uh, Jason Hu's kids are German. And uh, Ma Ying Zhou's kids Long are American. Long kids are German, too. Uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, they... they, they Wait, Jason Hu's daughter, isn't she an English movie she, star or something? She, well, she, she was in uh, Bridget Jones' mm. Diary. One of yeah, Bridget Jones' yeah, diaries. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, she, she's had some minor roles in some movies, um, right. in the UK. Um, and she, she married, I think, a Hong Kong movie star. Oh, something. that's right. Yeah. 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 I remember hearing that. So there's all this. So the next generation, right? Sean, the end kids. <clears throat> yeah. They can't, they can't they were run. Canadian. Yeah. They yeah. can't run because they, they have can't. foreign nationality. All of them. They have no so interest in running. Anyway. And but we see before they brought up Ma Ying Zhou was a second generation, Hao Long Bin second generation, Sean Lien's a second generation. All of these are the kids of the kids of the kids of these big, big KMT figures. Yeah. Well, this next generation they don't have one. They don't have another generation, and they don't cultivate fresh talent yep. from outside of their families. And Wu Duanyi's gone backwards on this. Hong Shou Zhu, um, and when Eric Chu was the chairman. And Hong Shouju <clears throat> uh, um, was was a candidate. They made some efforts, at least. Hong Shouju, she was tone deaf, but she did make a lot of efforts to speak to youth. Right now, she didn't which, know how to do it. But she didn't she did know it. how to do it, but she was trying. <laughs> um, and then Eric Chu actually did put some people like Jason Shu and some others on the yeah. party list, yeah. who were younger to try yeah. not as many as they should have, and not a lot, but they did have some. Um, so there was some 
uh, you know, there was some movement in that direction. But this latest, again, another colossal misstep by Udoni. <clears throat> by Udoni, because here's what he picked. It was all old guys. Right. <clears throat> Almost all mainlanders to make up 10 percent of the population or so. And old guys. <clears throat> and the thing about is that when you become a legislator, whether you're party list or not, that's a good chance to be interviewed on TV. It's a good chance to appear on the TV talk shows. Right. It's an opportunity to build a brand name. Right. So the only real up and comers I can think of who are younger are Johnny Chang. Yes. Uh, Yen Quan Hung. Both of them are, I, but I don't see him going very far. No, he's never going to get out of Dajia. No, I don't think he will. No. Johnny Chang, uh, Jiang Chi-san, uh, of the black faction in Feng Yun here in, in Taichung. Taichung. Uh, he might go places, but he's not a mainlander. That's his problem. Then there's Same the, with Ho Yoi. Yeah. The, the, the new Taipei city mayor. Yeah. The, and then the other potential legislator who might go places if he wins his election. Now, this is a, a very fascinating race. Is um is Wayne Wayne Chang? Oh right, um uh, Jiang Wanan, who is the grandson, uh, great grandson of Chiang Kai Shek, and the grandson of Zheng Jingguo. The and those are the and. But what's interesting is he didn't know he was the grandson until he was te late teens or twenties. Wow, he, that he must have been a shock. Yeah. He didn't know that he was the the grandson of, um, and then so originally he grew up with a different surname. God, I, I wish you I wish you'd stop talking about the grandsons of Jiang Kai Shek because yeah. I was alive when Jiang Kai Shek was alive. This yeah, means so I'm that. really really old. <laughs> <laughs> and folks, report tw <laughs> report tw. <laughs> but anyways, but he's running, and this this is one of those races that. Um, that everyone's watching is the DP. So he's he's a really handsome young guy. Yeah, he's a good looking guy. Yeah, and he seems actually reasonably, you know, like a fairly solid guy. I mean, and he's written some criticism of the KMT, and he's, he has. he's come out with some really pro democracy stuff too. Uh, he also he thinks like that generation. He 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 voted at, on at least it's on some of the provisions for marriage equality, uh, bucked the party there. Um, and, and so there's, you know, and so he's running in Taipei in a district in Taipei. I think it's, uh, Zhongshan North or something like that. Anyway, I'm not Taipei. So, um, and, but he's running against Enoch Wu. Oh Wino, yeah. Right. Of the DPP. Who's also a young guy with some military background and he's super fit and he's another good looking young guy. He, you know, he wrote that piece for the New York times and, um, so he's a real up-and-comer. So it's this battle between two hot young guys, basically. Um, and so a lot of people are watching this. And it's in Taipei, so the field is probably balanced as, toward uh, Wayne Chang. But, you know, Enoch, Enoch Wu's really kind of, he's getting a lot of attention. Yeah. He was on the Brian he's show. He's really good. He was on the late, on the late, on the night night show. Oh, that young, a lot of young people watch that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a good show. I watch it sometimes. And his sister operates the Ghost Island podcast, right? Emily, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, she, really? I think she's okay. Inaku's sister. Yeah. Okay. So he's got he's he's going to be good, even yeah. even if he doesn't win this election. There's good things will happen to him. No, it's brave running against <laughs> Wei yeah, Chang. I mean, in a KMT favored city. I mean, that was a pretty bold move. Okay. So what else is happening this week? The DPP is going to pass the anti infiltration bill. Looks like it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. KMT is obviously very much against that. So what else is going on? You know, the KMT has been now, what, like five elections in a row claiming that the DPP either has or will wreck the economy. Yep. That the KMT drumbeat is always that the DPP is bad for the economy. But mine, Joe, pretty much drove a truck through the possibility of supporting that yes. thesis <laughs> since he was way worse for the economy than John Swabian. Well, <laughs> I mean, because there was... There was a, a perception, and there was a lot of truth to it, back in the day that the DPP couldn't administer themselves out of a wet paper bag. Right. And back in the early days, that was pretty true for a lot of them of the DPP figures. And that Liu, uh, Liu Shouyan was a, was a notable uh, example Ex of a successful yeah. administrator. But most of the DPP administrators back in the day, they, they were great at organizing protest rallies and writing articles against the KMT. 
but that didn't mean that they knew how to run a government. Yeah. Um, so they were, they they just weren't personality wise. They weren't. Um, Chen Zhu was talking about that in Chen, her, Chen Zhu and the uh, former mayor of Kaohsiung, yeah. one of the Kaohsiung Eight, the Human Rights Day protest people who were arrested and then tried mm -hmm. by the KMT. Yeah. Back in the day. So Annette Liu took over uh, Taoyuan County. Uh, Chen Zhu ran uh, Kaohsiung. Kaohsiung. Yeah. I think those are the two who came out of the original, yeah, but, you yeah. know, out, out of that, that founding generation yeah. who got thrown in jail and all that, uh, who actually had skills to run things. Right. Um, but yeah, obviously, and that Linda Rigo made this point years ago in mm -hmm. a really nice little uh, talk where she, where she pointed out that the, those guys who were running the revolution. Then they started the party. The party was taken over by lawyers, right? Right. So Chen Suibin and Su Zhansang and Frank Xie were lawyers for the yeah. Kaohsiung Eight. Yeah. And the lawyers had a completely different way of doing things. They were on time. They were smart. Yeah. They were, you know, they were organized. They were, could all talk well, right? Yeah. And the activists who had who had, who had started the revolution, eh, they weren't good at those things. No. So and and Chen Zhu, again, she said that in her. If you can find it, it's on uh, Focus Taiwan. No, no, uh, oh, which is on report.tw. Report. You can find the article right. linked to there That's with there. some quotes, some very key <laughs> quotes, which I thought were, were particularly good on report.tw. <laughs> so anyway, here's the KMT accusing the DPP of being incompetent yep. on the economy. And meanwhile, the growth numbers for the third quarter this year, year on year, up 2.9%. Mm -hmm. And the, the, Taiwan, the island's getting a huge boost from the trade war and from uh, companies relocating back to Taiwan, apparently. Of course, uh, there's... Number two ben biggest beneficiary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and now it's looking like we might actually reach 3% growth mm -hmm. for this year, which would be really great for a mature economy like this one. Yeah. So... Unemployment's low. When you hear these claims... Wages have been rising. Wages mm -hmm. are rising, unemployment mm -hmm. going down, a lot of good news. Unemployment, I think, stable. Not... But, not yeah. Not all it's of it. It's stable at a news, low but... level. Yeah. Yeah. So when you hear these attacks, you can respond by saying, well, actually, that's not the case. But Mike, but Mike, w w how can we possibly prosper without more business with China? We have to save the ROC by getting closer to China <laughs> and become international by getting closer <laughs> to China. Yes. Well, you can see that when Han Goryeo was talking today about, uh, yeah. you know, uh, us us Taiwan going downhill and declining and being isolated and not having any respect. The obvious, the obvious uh, connection, the obvious connection then mm -hmm. is, well, we need to get closer to China to rectify these problems, which was essentially Ma ying argument yeah. back in his elections. Mm -hmm. So the KMT has not made any progress on these arguments. And again, that's Udwani not saying we need to change the way to, that we approach elections to appeal to whatever. I mean, I think actually when Ma, Ma ying made the case, he, ma he made a better case, and it was a better case to be made at the time. Right. Xi Jinping wasn't president. Um, China was not anywhere near as oppressive or as hostile. It was hostile, but it wasn't as hostile as now. Right. Um, and at the time, there were no three links. And this was something that, and the three links, by the way, were uh, air, uh, basically transportation, direct transportation links between Taiwan and China. Every, all traffic had to go via Hong Kong or a third country. Yeah. And so what happened was, and so I, I supported Ma ying in 2008. I, I wanted him to win. Um, and because the three links were necessary, because what was happening during Chen Suibian's era is there was a massive amount of businesses did move over to China. Right. Now, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, although he kept touting these export numbers, which are great, but it was Taiwan exporting the factory machinery, uh, which was really kind of depressing. And the, But also what was happening is that because the three links weren't there, and I experienced this because I was doing business in China for a while, is it would cost like 20,000 NT and take the entire day because you'd have to get to Taipei, you'd have to get on the plane Italian, you get to Hong Kong, and then you have to tr you know get another plane from Hong Kong to wherever it was going in China. So basically it was, a, a, it was very expensive, very time consuming. <clears throat> so while it made sense to move a factory mo making, say, for example, cheap plastic buckets, 
you know, labor is too expensive in Taiwan to make these things. I mean, right. you know, it's, it's a no-brainer factory pr processes for, you know. But the thing was is that Taiwan didn't really initially want to move the back-end people, R&D people, maybe not with plastic buckets, but with other products, the R&D people, the marketing people, the sales people, and the back-end people. They would have preferred to keep a lot of that here. The problem was is that they also have to be able to work with the people on the factory floor. And so the the lack of the three links meant that they were taking the back end people. They were moved who would have been paid similar salaries in China anyway. Right. They just moved them lock, stock, and barrel to China. Which and so the three links helped slow that process. So I think that Ma had a better case initially. Right. By 2012, I wasn't so supportive anymore <laughs> because I was afraid of what he'd do in his second term. Yeah. Um, ECFA was a bad, bad move. Uh, yeah. Um, but the initial three links, I think that he was right. I think that those needed to be done. Um, well, yes, of course. That's why the DPP started out negotiating with them yes. even before that. So Ma actually picked the low-hanging low fruit. Yeah. That was that the DPP had had established. They established the three mini links the DPP did. But I mean, they had Jimin. they had carried out negotiations with China, but then China refused to negotiate with them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so all that was out there. Well, all right. we're over thirty minutes, so we, we should probably. We got anything else? Only that Taiwan News has decided not to call oh. Xi Jinping president anymore. Yeah. Good on the uh, Taiwan News. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I hope the other news organizations here follow suit. Yeah. Very briefly, the title of Xi Jinping. Is that they the the Chinese Communist Party tries to portray him as a president, um, because that confers a lot more legitimacy, uh, like democratic legitimacy. But the reality is, is that his title is chairman or secretary general of the Chinese Communist Party. He's chairman of the country, like Chairman Mao. He's Chairman Xi. Uh, that's his official title. Um, but the Chinese state media in English uses the term president because it, it sounds better. Uh, the other distinction that the Taiwan News is also gonna start making, which is another good one, um, is that um, they are going to stop, they're gonna to refer to China as the people in the historical country and communist China uh, as the uh, current regime, separating the government from the people in the country. Yeah, that's a good idea too. It's a very good idea. Um, now they're not the they they're, they're calling on other publications to follow their lead. Actually, some other publications have been doing it for a while, but, <laughs> but it's good. But the fact of the matter is, it's it's an important step forward, and I do hope that some other publications do take that as lead. So all right, yeah, all right, guys. So remember, re report. T W. <laughs> all right. See you next week. All right. <laughs>